Hello, um, I'd like to warmly welcome uh, you all to this uh, London Climate Action Week event on inclusive green finance. Um, I am Ulrich Volz, I'm the director of the SOAS Centre for Sustainable Finance at the University of London. Um, and uh, I'll be the chair of this uh, session. Um, uh, this is an event that is jointly organized by uh, the Alliance for Financial Inclusion and uh, the Centre for Sustainable Finance at SOAS University of London. And um, yeah, I'm really delighted to have an excellent uh, cast of uh, colleagues uh, with me today. Um, we will have um, a keynote speech by uh, Shamshad Akhtar, um, uh, the former uh, governor of the Central Bank of Pakistan and also former finance minister um, and uh, other excellent colleagues. Um, and uh, I'll just say a brief, uh, uh, make, make a brief uh, introduction to the topic. Then um, Laura Ramirez uh, from uh, AFI and myself will uh, deliver a presentation uh, where we uh, briefly highlight the main points uh, of a report that uh, AFI did together with SOAS on inclusive green finance. And then I will uh, invite Shamshad Akhtar to deliver a keynote speech. And then we will have uh, interventions uh, from three distinguished colleagues from um, uh, uh, three central banks. And uh, then we will open up for discussion and uh, all of you will be also invited to uh, uh, contribute um, with questions and uh, so hopefully we'll have an interactive discussion. So let me say a few um, words why we're having this event. So after almost one and a half years, we're still in this terrible COVID crisis, um, which has reversed the progress that has been made in economic development in many uh, developing and emerging economies. Um, the World Bank estimates that around 120 million people have been pushed into extreme poverty in the last year. And uh, the reality, unfortunately, is that people at the bottom of the economic pyramid have been hit the hardest by this pandemic. And the same is true for global environmental change, climate change and other environmental degradation uh, is particularly affecting uh, those at the bottom of the economic, economic pyramid. And uh, today we're going to discuss the role that finance can play in supporting uh, these people. And um, we will present to you now uh, the concept of inclusive green finance. Um, as I said, this is a report um, that um, uh, Alliance for Financial Inclusion and so our Center for Sustainable Finance has uh, published together. Uh, a link will be shared uh, in, in, in the chat. Um, and I'll just uh, uh, go through the main takeaways and, and hand over to uh, Laura um, uh, in a moment. Laura is um, a policy manager for inclusive green finance at the Alliance for Financial Inclusion. Um, so, um, if you can move on to the next slide, please. Uh, yeah, so, exactly. So, um, we have seen an awful lot of discussion around green finance, sustainable finance, over the last couple of years, and also central banks and supervisors have started to work a lot on this topic. Um, and, of course, there's also been, for a long time, uh, financial inclusion agenda. Um, so these have been uh, become two prominent topics uh, in the policy world. There has also been a lot of work in the academic world on this, but uh, to a large degree, these two topics have been treated um, as two distinct, quite unrelated issues. Um, but that is actually, um, we believe, a wrong approach. There are very meaningful overlaps between these two areas of finance, and the uh, key target groups for financial inclusion tend to be disproportionately affected by the risks and impacts of local and global environmental change. And at the same time, they're also playing an important role in mitigating environmental change. So in our study on inclusive green finance, 
we call for a holistic approach that combines green finance and inclusive uh, um, financial inclusion policies in an integrated uh, inclusive green finance approach. Next slide, please. So we've made an attempt at conceptualizing inclusive green finance. And here we highlight the role of financial inclusion in three areas. First, in enabling adaptation. Second, in enabling mitigation. And third, in facilitating a just transition. Let me uh, talk about each uh, for a brief moment. Next slide, please. So first, financial inclusion and adaptation. Climate change has significantly negative impacts on people at the base of the economic pyramid. And that holds true both within and across countries. It's very evident that emerging market and developing economies are more vulnerable to climate change than advanced economies because of geography, demographic pressures, and also a reduced availability of resources to invest in adaptation. And climate change is compounding existing risks and vulnerabilities. And we have a large portion of low income households living um, in less favored agricultural areas, low elevation coastal zones uh, that are at higher risk of climate change and its effects. Um, so um, the risk for uh, low income households to be hit uh, by flooding, drought, natural disasters and other climate related catastrophes um, is higher. Next slide, please. At the same time, households at the base of the economic pyramid, uh, pyramid also have fewer resources available to protect themselves against adverse shocks. So the result is that climate change is hurting low income households uh, more than the rich. But it's not only an issue for households, it's also an issue in the corporate sector. Uh, we have shown empirically that climate vulnerability increases the financing cost for firms and worsens firms' access to finance. And these are problems that are particularly pronounced for micro, small, medium enterprises. And um, so we highlight that financial services can play an important role in empowering vulnerable parts of the population and also micro, small, medium enterprises to adapt to climate change. But of course, financial services need to be accessible, useful, and well-designed. Next slide, please. The second key area is financial inclusion and mitigation. It is of course clear that uh, the large bulk of emissions comes from the rich countries um, and also from uh, the richer uh, parts of societies. Um, still, economic agents at the base of the economic pyramid are also a, uh, an important part of global mitigation. Um, so, for example, micro, small, medium enterprises tend to operate in sectors that are often very energy intensive um, and also in need of technological change for climate change mitigation. If we take China, micro, small, medium enterprises are estimated to produce around half of the country's CO2 emissions. So we have uh, millions uh, of small enterprises in agriculture, forestry, fishing, manufacturing, and other climate sen uh, sensitive sectors that actually can make a tangible difference uh, in reducing their carbon footprint. Um, and just to highlight uh, one area, land use is of course um, a key uh, source of carbon emissions. And again, uh, you know, uh, we don't want to downplay the role of large uh, agro businesses but also smallholder agriculture can make a difference. And uh, agricultural innovations from seeds to irrigation systems can reduce land degradation, pollution and carbon emissions also um, in smallholder farming. Next slide, please. But there is a problem, even though often 
technological change is cost saving for micro, small, medium enterprises, many businesses do not have the financial tools to invest in these low carbon technologies. Uh, or often there are significant upfront costs. Um, so even though businesses or households would benefit from investments, uh, they cannot afford it. And uh, there are studies that show, for example, that uh, replacing traditional stoves with clean cookstove technology uh, would reduce greenhouse gas emissions equivalent to a decade's worth of global warming and prevent also around 10 million uh, premature deaths before, before 2050. Or another example would be installing solar panels. Um, that could help to bring down emissions, but it could also help to end energy poverty. Um, but we need to enable people to, to make these investments. And financial inclusion can make a real difference here. And we have uh, examples of very successful pay-as-you-go financing schemes, for example, helping micro, small, medium enterprises uh, to transition to more climate-friendly technologies. Um, uh, very good examples in, in various sub-Saharan African countries, for example. Uh, there are services such as leasing um, that can help low-income families to make the kind of investment uh, that will benefit their health um, and also uh, uh, help them to address poverty issues. Uh, next slide, please. The third area I want to highlight is the role that inclusive green finance can play in facilitating a just transition. And that is a really important point. Because uh, the impacts of global warming are disproportionately affecting vulnerable groups, this is also worsening inequality. And uh, inequality may also be affected and worsened by the transition impacts of climate change. So it's clear that to transition to a low carbon economy, we need to shut down, uh, phase out certain parts of the economy. And that will uh, lead to not only stranded assets, but also stranded work uh, workers. And we need to uh, make sure that each and every one uh, will get the support they need. Next slide, please. The Paris Agreement very explicitly acknowledges the imperative of a just transition of the workforce and creation of decent work and quality jobs. And um, it is also clear that without improving the socioeconomic situation of vulnerable groups, it will be very difficult, if not impossible, uh, to really have successful climate mitigation policies. We need to really make sure that everyone uh, is on board. And even though inclusive green finance is not the silver bullet, it can play an important role in supporting vulnerable groups in adapting to global environmental change, in strengthening their resilience and enabling mitigation of climate change and environmental degradation. So we clearly need the financial sector uh, to support and enable investments in new opportunities for those affected by environmental change. Next slide, please. Here you have a kind of a summary uh, chart showing the links between climate change and environmental degradation, vulnerable groups, social inequ inequity, um, and tensions, and also financial stability. So vulnerable groups really are at the heart of this. And, and um, if they are not supported adequately, um, uh, this will adversely have an impact uh, on uh, uh, successful climate mitigation. Um, if they are not adequately supported, uh, it will worsen social inequity and tensions, which will also undermine um, uh, successful climate policies and indeed uh, uh, prevent a just transition from occurring. But also importantly, in the context of central banks and supervisors, we need to highlight that um, both social inequity and tensions and worsening uh, climate change and environmental degradation can undermine financial stability. 
And we have now the NGFS, the network of central banks and financial supervisors for greening the financial system with more than 90 members who have been all uh, uh, very clear uh, that climate change and environmental degradation is a threat to financial stability. Um, so uh, that is also an important aspect. Uh, next slide, please. And this is the last slide before I hand over to uh, Laura. Uh, so we proposed a new policy framework for inclusive green finance where central bank supervisors um, uh, support um, uh, direct interventions, but also uh, adapt market shaping policies that will support both uh, the aims of inclusive finance and of climate change adaptation and mitigation. And um, I'm not going into detail here, but uh, there are a lot of uh, uh, different policies, both on the side of direct interventions, uh, you know, where traditionally subsidies or guarantees for certain credits and so on have been used, but also um, kind of a lot of uh, innovative, for, for example, digital solutions um, uh, on, on the market shaping policy side uh, where central bank supervisors can help to, to promote solutions. Um, and I'm sure we'll get back to, to uh, these later and, and also uh, hear some examples from policymakers. Uh, with this, I, I'd like to hand over to uh, Laura um, to give us some uh, overview of, of uh, work that uh, the Alliance for Financial Inclusion has been doing in this area. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Foltz, uh, for sharing this overview and interlinkages between financial inclusion and green finance and how inclusive green finance can build resilience and enable mitigation among the most vulnerable populations. I'm Laura Ramos. I'm the policy manager for the Inclusive Green Finance Working Group at the Alliance for Financial Inclusion, AFI. And I'm very delighted and honored to take part of this great event uh, and help to shape our future into a net zero one and also more equitable and resilient. Uh, today we will have the opportunity to bring learnings from AFI members on what inclusive green finance policies and initiatives are being implemented in different jurisdictions and I'm here to share our approach to inclusive green finance and also some current trends and considerations we have seen in our work with together with uh, financial regulators and that I hope that it will be of the interest of you. Um, <clears throat> so to start please allow me to do a brief introduction about what uh, AFI Global Network is. Uh, next slide please. And the Alliance for Financial Inclusion AFI is an horizontal model uh, peer learning network. Next please. Peer learning network for financial regulators and policy makers from developing and emerging countries. So far, the Alliance for Financial Inclusion worked together with 100 uh, financial regulatory bodies uh, from 89 emerging and developing countries, which represents about 85% of the global unbanked population. So AFI goal, um, AFI's goal is to support members to develop and implement successful financial inclusion policies that address country-specific challenges. And next slide, please. AFI provides its members uh, with financial inclusion policy and regulatory guidance through seven working groups uh, on key thematic areas for financial inclusion. So namely, there are consumer empowerment and market conduct working group, digital financial services working group, financial inclusion data working group, financial inclusion strategy pre-learning group, global standards proportionality working group, SME finance working group, and the most recent one that is this one, the inclusive green finance working group, which was officially launched in September 2019. Um, AFI launched the Inclusive Green Finance Program as part of the International Climate Initiative in 2018. In response to the heightened interest from the AFI network, member institutions committed to work together and collaborate with partners in identifying, understanding and implementing green financial inclusion policy solutions while focusing on communities most vulnerable to climate change. The IGF working group aimed at creating a common understanding of the topic of inclusive green finance uh, by sharing experience and building capacities to move forward the green agenda in the financial sector. So far, this working group is made of uh, 47 members institutions and they are making rapid progress uh, in implementing IGF policies. So we can see here that 25 countries have already implemented IGF policies. Also, they have produced 11 knowledge products 
which are mainly digital and print publications that capture lessons learned to disseminate knowledge gain through policy making and implementation in member countries and making it available to countries that are yet undertaking similar endeavors. So this brings me to uh, the definition of IGF. Next slide, please. The working definition for IGF is the following, that is policies and regulations that aim at enabling mitigation and building resilience to negative impacts of climate change and environmental degradation through financial inclusion. It is a rapidly developing policy area and financial regulators continue to adopt a range of policies, not just on resilience building, but to expand access to green technologies and include the poor in the transition to a low carbon economy. Indeed, IGF is a response to the current challenges uh, faced by climate change and we work together with financial regulators since there is a clear recognition that climate change deepens poverty, hits the most vulnerable hardest and climate change will, um, yeah, will impose a real climate risk in the countries that AFI members are. But then um, very quickly, the flip slide on, the, on that coin and also emerge, which is saying uh, financial inclusion can actually build the resilience in individuals and SMEs to the impact to the extreme weather events, as well as gradual warming of climate or gradual changes to the environment, uh, but it also empowers a small scale mitigation. Of course, we are not putting the burden on climate change mitigation on the most vulnerable communities in emerging and developing countries, but at this point it's about having um, all hands on deck but also empowering these populations to be part of the just transition. So the essence of the inclusive green finance is linked to building resilience to adapt and mitigate the impacts of climate change for the most vulnerable populations. Um, for instance, savings, uh, special formal savings can provide buffer against cost increases, diversity risks, access to credit, accelerate recovery and reconstruction following a climate change event. Um, and also insurance uh, can provide a safety net for uh, that can support immediate resumption of activities following a hazard event. Um, the digital financial enables, as we heard, not only uh, the access to these services, not only provide uh, access to these services, but also provide support to humanitarian response, response in case of disasters. So I'm not trying to say that IGF is a solution to everything, but it's one of the tools that it, we have in the toolbox uh, we currently have, and we are developing this together with uh, regulators in the network. Uh, so next slide, please. This is the four P framework on inclusive green finance, which is uh, which are defining promotion, provision, protection, and prevention, and we will discuss one by one. So the first P is following the slide uh, refers to policies. Uh, next slide, please. So the first P is a promotion and refers to policies and initiatives to prepare the private sector to offer financial services for green projects or, or environmental related activities to qualified beneficiaries. Uh, so here we have some examples for for moral suasion, which is being used in Philippines to promote financial towards environmentally sustainable activities or the awareness raising and capacity building, which a lot of financial regulators in the network are doing right now. And, and also the collection of green data, which is still very limited, but there have been uh, efforts such as the Bangladesh Bank, and we will hear later, um, regularly monitoring and reporting green uh, green activities and the Philippines that caters data on the impacts of disasters associated with natural hazards to understand the quantitative impacts and extreme, extreme uh, natural disasters to banking performance. Um, so the next one is provision, which refers to policies that helps to ensure financial resources for green projects or any uh, related climate action activities uh, th that these are provided to qualified beneficiaries, uh, whether through lending policies, refinancing on other uh, financing schemes. So most of these policies are monetary tools that were repurposed for a greener agenda. Um, so there is the green lending quotas that says a specific portion of resources specifically for green lending, such as the one in Bangladesh, Nepal, Egypt and Fiji. Um, so next one is protection and then we have protection policies here to reduce uh, the financial risk by socializing potential losses through insurance, 
credit warranties, uh, social payments, or other, or other related risk sharing mechanisms. These policies provide safety nets to build resilience and accelerate economic recovery following a natural hazard event. Protection policies that we found uh, or that we find across the network include the climate risk insurance, um, of which an example is the Central Bank of Armenia, led to establish a climate risk insurance system for smaller for smallholder farmers. Also, we have the credit risk warranties, uh, such as the uh, such as the Ghana incentive-based risk sharing system for agricultural lending, uh, namely Girsal. And yeah, also <clears throat> another policy could be <clears throat> allowing early sorry. <laughs> low and early partially withdrawal uh, from pensions funds. Uh, so this was uh, presented in Vanuatu. And the uh, last one is the prevention. Um, so these policies aim to avoid undesirable outcomes to lowering financial, social, and environmental risks. These policies are somehow linked with provision policies in terms of credit risk management. Uh, the most prominent is environmental and social risk management guidelines, which are present in the countries such as Nepal, Paraguay, Brazil, and Bangladesh. Um, so currently, AFI is supporting the Superintendencia de la Economía Popular y Solidaria uh, from Ecuador in the, in the development of the ESRM guidelines. Um, yeah, next slide, please. So here, um, there is some specific trends emerging that I would like to share um, with you. The specific path that many institutions are undertaking and the way they are embarking in developing IGF policies. The very first step is a shift of mindset, which is followed by awareness raising amongst uh, and capacity building of staff in both financial regulators, but also uh, financial institutions. We need to recognize that climate and environmental change is relatively new um, uh, to the financial sector. And there are some gaps in understanding the role of the financial policymakers and responsibilities on this area with regards to uh, inclusive foreign finance. That is usually followed by a mapping of climate vulnerabilities and assessments of environmental of environment related risks to the financial system to inform further policy developments uh, and decisions on. This um, will also include a mapping of existing IGF policies or initiatives from the private sector and national level climate policies. This is done hand by hand uh, with broader coordination and the dialogue around IGF development nationally. Financial regulators are indeed not only the actors in advanced green finance uh, and the collaboration is quite crucial. This coordination involves the strategic calls and expectations and it will for example, include integration of the IGF elements into the national financial inclusion strategies or a national green finance strategy or even the development of a national green roadmap. Um, in order to develop policies concretely, um, many of the institutions come up with clear definitions of what green means in a specific national taxonomies, including what green uh, means for individuals and SMEs. So the development of green taxonomy is considering low income households and the most vulnerable sectors as well. That brings us to the core of what we're discussing today, that is how to adapt existing policies and regulations to uh, or develop new policies to incentivize and facilitate greening the financial system. Um, so there are also some considerations to develop the environmental and social risk management frameworks for banks and institutional and financial institutions. Um, linked to all of these, there are some further considerations that it's uh, how to incorporate gender considerations into the IGF policies, a better understanding and leverage of the digital financial services to advance and enhance inclusive green finance, foster data gathering and development, uh, a country measurement and monitoring framework to track progress. Also, uh, elevate the importance of the inclusive green finance to standard setting bodies and consider uh, integrating IGF policies into the recovery during and after the economic crisis followed by the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, so last but not least, uh, in order to move the needle, uh, AFI support members through three different, uh, three main programs. That is the development of policy guidance through the IGF working group, uh, providing capacity building, uh, 
uh, to our members and also with grants for in-country implementation for these specific policies. Uh, well, I will stop here because we will go in detail with some specific IGF policies coming from some AFI members in the following panel. Then I hand over to Professor Holtz. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Laura, for this great overview of um, AFI's inclusive green finance policies. I'd now like to uh, warmly invite uh, Shamshad Akhtar to deliver a short keynote address. Uh, Shamshad it has a, a remarkable uh, career. Um, she is currently chairperson of the Pakistan Stock Exchange uh, and chair of the board of directors of Karandas Pakistan, which is a collaborative, innovative finance and digital financial inclusion platform uh, which is supported by um, DFID and uh, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Um, Shamshad served as the 14th governor of the State Bank of Pakistan, which is Pakistan's central bank, and uh, she was the first woman to do so. And uh, she has also served as the finance minister of Pakistan, and uh, she was under secretary general at the United Nations, um, uh, where she was also the um, Executive Secretary for the UN Economic and Social Commission for Asia and the Pacific. Uh, and she's also held uh, numerous uh, very senior posts at the World Bank and the Asian Development Bank as Special Advisor to the UN Secretary General um, and on and on. So I'm not uh, going to uh, go further into this, but I'd like to warmly invite Shamshat to give us some swords on inclusive green finance drawing on her vast experience as a policymaker and also an intellectual who has been shaping uh, the um, sustainable development discussion. Uh, Shamshat, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you, Uli. Um, you forgot to mention that I am a member on your institution's advisory board. And, I have and been we are there. extremely grateful for that. Thank you so much. <laughs> and um, I think I have personally watched uh, the phenomenal contribution of the Swiss Center in the Sustainable Finance. Effie, I have been uh, following up uh, during my whole career on, uh, in finance, particularly also at the United Nations. Uh, we're working on the sustainable finance. <clears throat> so inclusive finance, and green finance have been critical innovations in the world of finance, given their strong implications, as I see, for humanity and planet. Integrating the two will be a powerful move and synergize the two sources of finance. It will enhance the potency of ethical and sustainable finance. And I hope that it goes beyond the examples uh, that have been covered in the report. Today, we have more tools at hand to achieve. Technological solutions is one uh, that's available to us. Digital corridors and payment systems, FinTech solutions, et cetera. They all allow us an opportunity to promote inclusive green finance, not just inclusion, but inclusive green finance uh, seamlessly and effectively. Hence, I think the report is very timely and very welcome. We thought pandemic is terrible. Climate change will be lethal, as I always say, as it respects nothing that it's in its way, within the geographical corridors, but does not also respect borders. Climate change is deeply unjust. Developing countries that have contributed to global climate change are hit the worst. These countries carry the burden of larger proportion of global population, larger household sizes, and have disproportionate share of natural, natural disasters. The SMEs, which are really the backbone of a number of economies and employ the most vulnerable and relatively poor people, 
contribute substantially to the global value chains. Though there are and will continue to be shifts in these value chains post COVID. Further transformation in these micro and SMEs that employ a large proportion of your population or which survives on this sole source of income is underway as developed countries are fast moving to technology and artificial intelligence that will further change the value chain corridors and the way businesses and production processes are managed. So we also know that green finance has suddenly become a product of the West and it is available in limited doses in the developing countries in particular South. So we don't want these inequalities to perpetuate. We want both inclusive and green finance to work hand in hand to address some of these issues. Within countries, inequalities of opportunities, outcomes, income and services have grown. And it is the poorest who are suffering the most, who have the least possibility to adapt to the physical impacts of climate change. Hence, as I mentioned earlier, that I welcome the study by Suez and Effie. It makes an important contribution as it suggests how one goes about exploiting synergies and reinforcing two sources of finance and develops the conceptual framework of this idea of combining both the inclusive and green finance under one terminology and under one source. It highlights that key target groups for financial inclusion tend to be disproportionately exposed to the risks and impacts of local and global environmental change while also playing an important role in mitigating local environmental change. The study brings out aptly the overlaps between green finance and financial inclusion and highlights the need for monetary and financial authorities to take a holistic approach in addressing these in an integrated, inclusive green finance approach. It illustrates the multiple ways in which environmental sustainability and reduction of environment related financial systemic risk, the main goals of green finance policies and poverty alleviation and social inclusion, the main goals of financial inclusion policies are connected and need to be synergized and leveraged to each other's advantage for the larger benefit of the people. I'd like to briefly illustrate this challenge for my own country, Pakistan. According to 2017 Global Findex database, Pakistan, which is home to 225 million people, has the world's largest unbanked population close to 100 million and ranks third after China and India with 190 million unbanked adults. At the same time, the impact of global and regional emissions, not the, not the um, national emissions, it's the global and regional emissions are compounding the country's climate vulnerabilities, resulting in melting of glaciers in the north, flooding across the fertile agriculture land, nurtured by the famous Indus River, where the oldest civilization thrived around where the water was. And of course, we are being hit by recurrent natural disasters. The Global Climate Risk Index 2020 ranks Pakistan as fifth most vulnerable country to climate change. Pakistan's vulnerability is evident. Country lost close to 
10,000 lives suffered economic loss, losses worth 3.8 billion and, <clears throat> excuse me, and witness 152 extreme weather events from 1999 to 2018. The reversal of progress in poverty and social gains during the pandemic were inevitable because of protracted lockdowns and contraction of output, which has been very severe for developing countries. Growing pollution and the pandemic has exposed the risks of unhealthy environment and ill affordability of the population to seek recourse to a creaking healthcare system in developing countries. As I was speaking to you, there was a news item flashing that Karachi city, which is home to about 25 million people with several squatters where population density is unbelievable high and provision of services very poor is now in the worst heat wave that you can imagine. So talking about combining these two powerful instruments of finance would be a welcome decision by the authorities for Pakistan. Inclusive green finance policies as highlighted in the study holds real potential to make a tangible difference to the life of those of the bottom at the bottom of the economic pyramid. With the evolving, what we call the RAS program, Pakistan has laid foundation for a broad-based digital financial inclusion platform with Karandas, which is an agency that Uli mentioned is a joint, has a joint sponsorship of Bill Melinda and Gates, UK FCDO now, the old name was different. It has helped us lay the foundation for the development of micropayment gateway system that has the potential to broaden and deepen the access to financial services. And it has offered in midst of the COVID-19 phenomenal transfer of resources close to about 168 billion rupees, which is a lot of money for Pakistani budget to help adaptation to environmental change and enhance resilience, central banks and supervisors, as Uli has already elaborated, can implement it. regulatory enable enablers. There's a lot of work on taxonomy going on. There's a lot of work figuring out how to get all these things right. But I think we need to make sure that it is serving the mobile money it's servicing the um, SMEs effectively and the micro enterprises people. It's servicing micro insurance and other resilience supporting digital financial services. To help mitigation of environmental change and at the same time support developmental goals, central banks and supervisors can enable digital solutions such as pay as you go, solar and water and the likes. So let me conclude um, by throwing out a few further thoughts. Financial markets thus far seem to be the world of banks and, in and then next is the insurance businesses. Of course, this is very different in the developed world where major flow of resources come from the capital markets and from private finance uh, mostly. Hence, I'm really excited that I'm actually, uh, very recently I have started chairing the Pakistan Stock Exchange and I'm hoping that we can count on these stock exchanges. Uh, about 99 of them have already uh, been certified as sustainable stock exchanges and hopefully Pakistan will follow uh, this trend 
and promote ESG finance on the platform of the um, uh, of the exchanges, um, so that we could incentivize a move towards um, inclusive green finance, and also um, the small and medium equity markets need to be developed, and PSX has. Uh, what it calls a gem market, which needs to be jump-started. I do count on also insurance regulators to be in the game because microinsurance and insurance at large for the climate vulnerabilities is very critical. So we should work together with what's out there to develop inclusive green finance policies and develop um, collectively green finance pools, be it the funds or be it something else, to work towards uh, pushing for green inclusive finance. Thank you, Uri, for inviting me. Thank you so much, Shamshad, for your very, very interesting uh, thoughts. And um, uh, we'll come back to, to uh, you later. So um, please uh, uh, join the, the discussion uh, later. But first we will uh, now move to um, our panelists. We have three excellent panelists from uh, three different uh, central banks. Um, and uh, I'd like to first invite uh, Najwa uh, Mahuri, who is the lead of the Green Finance Unit at uh, Bank Al Maghrib, the central bank of um, Morocco, to um, uh, deliver her uh, input and tell us what um, uh, she has been uh, trying to develop in terms of inclusive green finance. Thank you so much for being with us. Najwa, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Professor Rolls. Um, uh, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. I will try today to briefly present our journey toward promoting inclusive green finance to also leave enough space for the interactive session of questions and answers. Um, at the Central Bank of Morocco, we have actually uh, implemented a progressive approach to promote inclusive green finance, starting first by closely collaborating with the national stakeholders uh, following an interagency uh, cooperation process on the sidelines of COP22 that is actually hosted uh, in Morocco in 2016. The Central Bank at that time has brought together the Ministry of Finance, the Banking Association, but also um, the regulators of financial uh, markets uh, and uh, insurance companies to coordinate the elaboration of a national roadmap for aligning the financial sector with sustainable development. Um, this roadmap focuses actually, among other key pillars, on the promotion of financial inclusion as a key driver for sustainable development and has led to the elaboration of a national strategy for financial inclusion. Um, since the uh, elaboration of this roadmap, Bank of Maghrib has actually started closely uh, engaging with the banking institutions, with, which also fall under our supervisory remit, but also with other uh, stakeholders of the financial sector and ministerial authorities of environment and finance to address the key challenges that may prevent the financial institutions and banking institutions more specifically from providing more financing to support climate resilience, uh, especially of the most vulnerable populations. Um, uh, more specifically, as regards the engagement with the banking sector, uh, Bank of is actually working on raising climate and environmental related risks awareness across banks uh, and building a collective understanding of these new and emerging topics by leveraging international expertise and partnership we have with many uh, international experts, uh, including the World Bank and MBDs, but also international fora uh, in which we are also involved as a member. Um, and uh, one other key pillar of our work to promote inclusive green finance is actually from the international uh, side, we are also being involved in international forums and groups on green finance, inclusive green finance, but also sustainable, uh, uh, sustainable finance. <clears throat> Sorry, as a steering committee member of the Network for Green in the Financial System, a member of the Aliens for Financial Inclusion, but also a member of the Sustainable 
banking network. Uh, through this involvement in international work, we are trying to build the in-house capacities to be uh, able in turn to build the necessary capacities across banking institutions. And we are trying to ensure uh, that all the key developments at the international level are also taken um, into consideration the um, perspectives of developing countries. Uh, one other key pillar of our work is actually the building of the necessary uh, supportive regulatory framework. Uh, this is actually after a first phase where actions were uh, essentially led by uh, voluntary commitments of banking institutions and the financial sector more globally, following the commitment on sustainable finance uh, during the COP22. Uh, we have uh, set a first, um, supervi first supervisory expectations for banks on managing the financial risks from climate change and environmental degradation to also um, uh, to uh, harmonize the practices across banking institutions but also accelerate the efforts as regards uh, managing these risks uh, the financial risks stemming from climate change and environmental uh, degradation for instance but also while also um, incentivizing them to provide more financing to support climate change mitigation and adaptation efforts at the national level. Um, and last but not least, uh, we are also going through a uh, risk assessment exercise to assess the climate-related risks exposures in the banking sector to have a more uh, deep, a deeper understanding of uh, to what extent banking institutions may be exposed to financial risks from climate change with the support of the World Bank. Uh, this global program and this first phase of a more global program, which actually aims to build the necessary supervisory framework and practices for climate climate-related risk uh, should serve uh, the risk assessment exercise, which is the first step of, of this program, should serve as a basis for further regulatory development, especially on reporting and stress testing to enhance uh, the availability of climate data while also capturing the flow of risk that may not be of use immediately. Uh, we are also aiming through this global program to raise uh, awareness and uh, build the necessary capacities across banking institutions to ensure they effectively implement uh, the regulatory uh, um, guidelines that we have issued and that we are planning to issue in the very near future. Um, I will stop here and I would be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Najwa. Uh, I'd like now to invite uh, Stephen Arma, who's uh, the manager of the banking uh, supervision department of the Bank of Ghana, to tell us uh, what the Bank of Ghana has been uh, up to uh, in terms of inclusive green finance. Uh, Stephen, the floor is yours. Thank you, Professor Walls. I hope you can hear me clear. Very well, thank you. Uh, thanks so much. So the issue is climate change. And um, of course, um, climate change is becoming a big issue for um, the global world. I mean, the implication it presents to the financial stability, uh, financial system. And we do appreciate um, the issues. In Ghana here, we ourselves have started having our own share of the effect of the climate change. Um, the extreme weather, we're beginning to have in extreme weather conditions, you know. Um, we, 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 we also have some social issues in our jurisdiction that we have to deal with. Um, because of that, um, in 2015, we started developing this idea of policies to really um, see how best we can, of course, um, contribute to this climate change or uh, to really reduce the impact it has within our system. So um, in our commitment to the UN, I mean, sustainable development goals, and of course the, um, the UN framework convention on climate change, we had to collaborate with um, some key stakeholders within Ghana, that is the Ghana Association of Bankers, the Environmental Protection Agency and the Bank of Ghana, of course, in pursuit of sustainable banking um, stewardship. Um, like I said earlier on, in 2015, we developed, uh, we had to form a committee um, just to really then come up with some um, principles that will um, guide, or of course, the banks who adopt them and, and or just to address the issue of climate change. Um, of course, we, in, in a journey to the sustainability, we had to do some visit to some countries like um, Bangladesh. We had to go to Kenya to learn from them. We had to go to Nigeria to, of course, study um, their journey to sustainability. 
that inform us in, you know, of course, coming up with some of these principles. Um, we also have to work with um, some of these international organizations like um, CEPYFC, UNEPFIs, and of course, um, AFI. Now, we have actually, through this consultation, and of course, um, the committee setting up, uh, uh, um, coming together, we came up with seven, um, sorry, seven principles. Um, that was in um, 2019, and then it was launched in 2019, November. Uh, the first principle is focusing on environmental and social risks that we want the banks to, of course, identify, measure, and mitigate um, ENS risks in their activities. And of course, are they, uh, both at the supply and then the demand side. And then also, we want to also focus on, of course, um, promoting good corporate governance and ethical standards. We want institutions also to also promote um, gender equality. We want institutions also to promote financial inclusion. And I must say that financial inclusion, we have been working with AFI to really push this agenda. And currently there is ongoing um, support from AFI to see how best we can really um, push this agenda within the system. And then the last principle is focusing on the reporting um, of these principles to the central bank. We're currently looking at the principles being applied to a key, five key sectors. We're looking at agriculture and forestry, construction and real estate, manufacturing, power, energy, mining, and of course, um, oil. And uh, these sectors are effectually per our own assessment, really expose the banks to material, environmental, and social risks. Um, currently, we are at the implementation phase of this whole project. We've um, requested banks to begin to report on the principles, of course, just to for us to see how best they are operationalizing their principles. For that matter, we've developed some templates for the banks. Um, we have received the first um, report. We yet to review them, and of course, oh, yes, um, okay. really. Then, of course, then that will help us to really know exactly what kind of policy actions. Again, do we have to come up with um, to the industry? But like um, has been said by the other panelists, um, I mean, climate change is a big issue. And of course, we need to come up with all this idea of policies to really address and to build the resilience of our institutions, yes. of course, with implication on financial stability. So, so far, I will, I will end here. If there are any questions, then probably we can um, focus on. But Ghana is really on this, we want the sustainability. We've done quite a number of things, and we are ready to share with um, other um, partners or other 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 members. Thank you very much, Professor Walsh. Thank you very very much, uh, Stephen. So, Birendra, please. Um, uh, uh, so, uh, he's joint director for uh, of the Financial Inclusion Department at uh, Bangladesh Bank. Thank you, Dr. Willy, Madam Sansad. Ms. Laura, and distinguished panelists and also participants. Actually, I am likely to touch upon the initiative that Bangladesh Bank has taken to promote green finance initiative as well as increase financial inclusion in Bangladesh. As you might heard that uh, from the presentation of Ms. Laura, that in the year of 2009, we introduced green finance policy for the first time in Bala, uh, first time and also initiated a refinance scheme that uh, aimed to produce uh, the green products by the micro entrepreneurs and also the enterprises, uh, equivalent to BDT 4 billion taka. And in 2011, we introduced a guideline on environmental risk management for the financial uh, institutions, banks and financial institutions. And another guideline we issued in 2011, that is on for green banking. And uh, several refinance schemes, such as uh, the Brickland Efficiency Improvement Project, with the assistance from ADB and also from local sources, we initiated 50 million US dollar and also 50 million euro 
for improvement of the efficiency of the bricklaying that uh, to reduce the carbon emission, you know. And in 2016, we introduced Green Transformation Fund. And uh, out of this fund, 40 million uh, USD has been disbursed to the sectors that are producing green products. And also during the prior to the pandemic, starting of the pandemic, we introduced several refinance schemes aiming at uh, retrofitting of the uh, actually garment factories and to improve the work environment of the garments factories. And as you know that Bangladesh Bank is, uh, Bangladesh is the home of MFS after Kenya and some other countries. Uh, we have 96.5 million registered clients of MFS. So we try to focus all of our financial inclusion activities mainly on uh, MFS products and as well as the no frill accounts. Those are actually our uh, policy instrument that aims to include increase the financial inclusion in Bangladesh and as well as to address the climate issue in parallel. And we have issued several guidelines for regarding the uh, CHR ex expenses by the banks and financial institution. And we are guiding them that uh, at least 60% of their CSR activities, CSR fund should be expenses expend to the climate to uh, reduce the climate adverse effect of the climate change and immediately after any climate shock such as uh, you know Bangladesh is prone to natural disasters such as uh, flash flood and earthquakes and even sometime we are actually facing drought in some areas as well so to fight them to enhance the capacity of the of that locality people of that locality we introduce immediately guide banks and financial institutions to take some measures for example uh, some areas have river irrigation problem so we allocate some fund to finance to the affected people in a soft loan known as a soft loan and is at a reduced rate and also directed banks to expand some of their certain portion of their CSR, CSR fund to that area to uh, enhance the resilience of the flood affected people and so uh, the affected people due to the climate change and just uh, after the hard hit of COVID pandemic we have issued several guidelines so that the people can be uh, reached through digital means. For example, uh, we already introduced uh, interoperability between the MFS providers so that uh, one MFS provider can have access to their bank account as well, uh, MFS users. So there uh, are interoperability prevails in Bangladesh and one MFS provider can, MFS subscriber can have access to bank account as well. And also we channelize all the government, uh, actually government payments to the digital means. We directed all the MFS providers, banks to open account of the marginal people in using the KYC and to provide the case assistance through their uh, digital means and also to uh, through their bank accounts. So you know in Bangladesh after the starting of the pandemic we have around 100 billions of uh, PDT refinance scheme. Most of those are uh, aiming at to make the MSMEs 
micro entrepreneurs and micro credit receivers to enable them fight the pandemic so that they are not uh, run out of cash to maintain their regular businesses so as well as we also initiate some sort of micro insurances that uh, so that uh, in during their distress time people uh, might not fall actually it's, uh, it's a guard to guard their hard earned money and also to their assets as well so these are the summary of the initiatives of bangladesh bank that have taken recently and as you might heard uh, that the users of the mfs accounts and also accounts has raised during those pandemic sessions so i am hopeful that the initiatives that are aimed to increase financial inclusion as well as to fight the adverse effect of the uh, climate change uh, will not be big tax for bangladesh bank so all the uh, we are also uh, act vigilantly during the pandemic period and also any disaster period so these are the summary that our bangladesh bank has taken so far thank you mr billy thank you so much uh, uh, birendra and again apologies i <laughs> that i uh, jumped over you this was uh, no bad intention at all I, I feel so bad about it um so uh, may i now please ask uh, all speakers to to switch on their their camera um we actually uh, have a very little time left so we're almost moving towards the, the final concluding round um, but let me throw uh, in this question that I raised before. So, um, on you know, building on the work that you and your institutions have been uh, doing already in the area of inclusive green finance, uh, are there any issues uh, that that you approaches that you have found particularly uh, promising, um, or if you like? Uh, you can also highlight uh, issues that you found particularly challenging in addressing, but where you would like to make progress. Um, I don't know who, who would like to, to go uh, first on that one. Okay, uh, this is Stephen. Prof, uh, if I can touch on your question, just to you know, see if, if I can address it. But of course, from our perspective, Ghana here, I think if you look at the seven principles that I mentioned earlier on, one of them being the promotion of financial inclusion, I think the COVID has come to really um, give strong support to this principle. Um, if you look at the impact of the COVID and what it's doing globally, then as a country, we have seen that, um, I mean, it, it's good that we, can, we give these principles to the banks to really to really address um, financial inclusion. That means that they need to come up with some products that will actually be brought to the underserved. And the COVID has really supported this whole um, um, principle. Uh, and, and I think um, the other side is that now that we've come up with these principles, I think the same COVID has also brought some challenge that we're not able to do, um, I mean, on-site examination to see how these banks are operationalizing um, these whole principles. But of course, with the financial inclusion, we've seen the effort being made, and I think it's very promising. Um, at the gender side, to this, we see significant um, improvements also uh, being given to that particular principle. So I think on the, on the whole, if you ask me, I would say that the promotion side in respect of the idea of policy is, is promising. I mean, we, we have so much that we have to do, talk of awareness that we have to create, um, um, data collection that we have to do. Uh, and so I see that aspect to be more um, promising. And I think um, um, the future is very bright and we just wait to see how the whole thing is going to evolve. Thank you. Great, thank you. That's good to have a positive outlook, um, especially in, in these dire times. Um, Najwa, uh, Birenda, do you want to chip in and, and uh, building on report from your experiences? 
Yes, if I may, um, just regarding the uh, experience of uh, the Southern Bank of Morocco, I would say that what was very promising is actually this interagency cooperation process uh, to build a sort of um, a common coordinated and progressive approach to get uh, the allied national stakeholders alignment and buy-in, uh, but also to provide a broad framework and principles to promote inclusive green finance while also ensuring the management of financial risks uh, for financial institutions as regards climate change and environmental degradation. Uh, this uh, was uh, really something that I have accelerated the efforts at the national level and ensured uh, an alignment of the strategy, financial system-wide strategy and roadmap with the uh, policy, uh, national policy objectives and targets and climate targets. Uh, as regards the future, we are striving for uh, incentive uh, for um, further regulatory incentives, actually, we want to further incentivize uh, financial institutions and more specifically banking institutions to further unlock green financing from their side. And for that, we are thinking about um, green, lend green lending facilities. So uh, it could be a good, uh, a good uh, included green finance promotion initiative. Uh, to put in place, uh, especially if it is well designed and combined with some fiscal measures, it can provide um, an impetus for more green and inclusive green financing from banking sector. So this is actually the two uh, promising uh, initiatives uh, as regards our previous experience and what we are planning uh, to do uh, uh, as we go forward on promoting inclusive green finance, but also uh, ensuring uh, from the provision side that uh, financial institutions are also supporting climate resilience, uh, especially among the most vulnerable populations and enterprises. Thank you so much, Najwa. I think the highlighting the, this, the importance of having an interagency approach is really, really important. Um, Birendra, may I uh, turn to you to, to sure. hear? Sure. Uh, we have a, a national coordination committee to uh, look after the green initiatives from a central point uh, central point of view led by the ministry of finance so as you might uh, know that uh, bangladesh has also an environmental fiscal policy initiatives so uh, and they have a plan to take measures on certain products and uh, procedures to let the uh, industrial be green and Bangladesh Bank is actually participating actively in that committee and uh, we are actually vibrant for the initiative that requires central bank attention. Apart from this, Bangladesh government has some green projects and also uh, funding them by their uh, various agencies such as uh, some, some government funding has been apart, uh, allocated to, to give them support to introduce green products and also helping the uh, promotion of some products in the media and etc. Thank you, uh, Rendra. And uh, indeed, uh, Bangladesh has, has been, has been the pioneer in many of these initiatives, uh, indeed the very first central bank uh, to, to work on green finance. Um, uh, Shamshat, may I turn to you, and, and this is indeed now the, the, the closing round, so the, <laughs> the we, we, my, my timekeeping hasn't been as good as should have been. Um, Shamshat, uh, having listened to, to um, the presentations of the different initiatives in, in Ghana and, and Morocco and Bangladesh, uh, do you want to give some some thoughts on on you know what 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 should be the next steps? Uh, you you click twice on. Okay, is that can you hear yes. me? Yes. Um, so let me give uh, uh, about four five pointers. Uh, I think it was very um, useful to listen to everybody and, and to have an overview of your report to your and Laura's presentation. Uh, so my take on financial inclusion and green finance is that as it is under separate uh, windows, 
uh, we needed to work on the value proposition of these uh, two sources of finance. And now um, uh, uh, encouraging a synergy between the two requires uh, more education on the value proposition uh, of the two, both uh, from the supply and the demand side, uh, so that people understand effectively uh, what it entails. Uh, second, of course, um, uh, structuring these initiatives require a close proximity at the local level. And I think uh, engaging both the uh, national governments is one thing, but engaging the local governments uh, is going to be quite critical in this whole process because in the design of the environmental uh, programs, uh, it is very much a provincial uh, state or, um, uh, or a district level uh, pro um, uh, jurisdiction. And there you need to get the policies uh, right. Um, another important thing is really changing the incentive system uh, in the world of finance. We end up um, giving more subsidies to uh, the large corporates uh, and for export purposes, um, that distorts uh, the financing framework of where the finance needs to go. So one needs to really think through, and as you know, during COVID, a lot of funding has gone even below the normal uh, refinancing rate or the policy rate. And I believe that has actually changed uh, the incentive framework to be very perverse because people avoid going to the other windows for financing if you get cheap loans and the cheap loans are not available for inclusion, inclusive or, or green finance necessarily. They are um, really um, being invested into uh, more an environmental unfriendly production processes. So I think it's going to leave um, uh, deep marks uh, on the financial system and some reversal needs to be uh, thought through. Um, just the last point is that more funding from multilaterals um, um, or other sources, institutional investor funding needs to now recognize the value proposition of inclusive and green finance so that, and as I said um, in my little overview, that we need to really think through uh, and consider setting up specialized funds uh, which would uh, make uh, both the um, packaging as well as the uh, retailing and disbursement uh, of this uh, mixed proposition that we have come up with. Over to you, Tony. Thank you so much, Shamshad. I think these were very, very uh, relevant points. Uh, I'd like to, to invite Laura to, to give her final reflections and then I'll, I'll, I'll uh, end yes. uh, this session. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor Waltz. So yes, I, I totally agree with all uh, of all these panelists because, and also with uh, Dr. Shamshat, because uh, I think the first step is the, um, the increasing awareness of this topic in, inside institutions, inside uh, the central banks, and also uh, building capacities is quite crucial. So at this point, and something that you was asking, what is promising, what we are seeing in the AFI network is that more members are reaching us to have this uh, capacity building right now. So there is a, a very high interest in what is really promising. And yeah, for sure. I think that the national coordination is also very critical because otherwise it's impossible to establish, to, to, put, in, uh, to put in place such policies. So um, also when you are defining what green means, uh, it's the first time that we have to involve another entity. So it's not only coming from the financial sector, but from other institutions. So like ministries of environment or ministries of commerce, ministries of everybody has to be together in this in this task or in these endeavors. And yeah, so my 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 last reflection is I I wouldn't like to 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 repeat the same because of course I think that all. Uh, for mobilizing, uh, or in order to mobilize all the, the fundings, 
uh, so defining what is what is green and also to to have a very established uh, green framework is also very very relevant but uh, uh, yeah I wouldn't like to repeat the same because I think all of us are uh, agreeing in the same topics but uh, my only uh, on my final reflection here is that I think that we have to put uh, the hands on in on this specific topic right now because uh, you know it's, this is so this is not the end or this is not everything. So IGF wouldn't have all the, of the, all the solutions right now, but this is something that is coming from the financial sector. But I think everybody has to, to establish and to start to, to include the environmental and social governance in whatever they are working on, because uh, we need to work together to achieve the, the sustainable development goals together and yeah the time is running so maybe starting tomorrow it will be late so this is my final reflection thank you very much thank you so much laura well i think we, we've had some some very very good thoughts uh, from from all of you and um i i fully agree with laura it, it the time to to act is now i mean uh, the the pandemic has has reinforced uh, the need to strengthen resilience across our economies and we cannot strengthen resilience of our economies and societies without really making sure that everyone um, is, is involved and, and, and um, uh, put in a position where they can um, uh, uh, go on uh, about um, uh, their uh, business in a way um, that they can really uh, um, uh, uh, kind of self-determine their past. So um, I think we have, of course, seen so much attention now in the area of green finance. Um, and I think it's really important that we reinforce that it's not only about the green, but also that the, the social dimension uh, is so closely intertwined and that we have to, to really uh, also uh, put this more prominently in the central banking supervisory work. And, and it's very encouraging uh, the work that that AFI has been doing uh, with all its members in the area of inclusive green finance. I think a lot of progress has been made there, uh, but, but I think it's also clear that that still there is still a lot of work to be done. Um, but I I think we've had a lot of kind of optimistic outlooks from from you, which is great. Um, so so let's try to to move this forward um, and really make sure that um, the financial sector can contribute to addressing the major challenges of our times, which are certainly on the climate and environmental side, but also the social side, and we cannot be successful in one without addressing the other. And finance has to play an important part, and this will not happen without those who govern finance, which is central banks, supervisors, of course also finance ministries, uh, really play a leading role in making this happen. So with this, Thank you uh, so much, uh, Shamshat, for delivering a wonderful keynote. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Stephen, uh, Berendra, Najwa, for your wonderful inputs. And of course, also Laura and Afi for this great partnership. Um, so we, we do have uh, a little animation uh, uh, video <laughs> on this uh, inclusive green finance uh, report. Uh, I'm not sure if the, the plan is to, to play it now, but... Um, uh, it's also available on the website. Um, but again, thank you so much, everyone. Uh, take good care and let's all make sure that we move this agenda forward. Um, and uh, maybe maybe you can uh, put this video, uh, you can turn it on and whoever wants to cling on, uh, it's two minutes long or something. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Uli, and thank you to all the other panelists. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Climate change contributes to financial instability and threatens to drag millions of people around the world into grinding poverty. Among those most vulnerable are low-income households and micro, small, and medium enterprises, or MSMEs, in developing economies. 
Inclusive Green Finance addresses these social and environmental risks by empowering vulnerable populations to build resilience and mitigate the impact of climate change. By integrating green finance goals into financial inclusion, Inclusive Green Finance enables financial regulators and policymakers to focus on transitioning to a low-carbon and sustainable economy. How does financial inclusion help in enabling adaptation to climate change? Digital financial services such as mobile money, credit, or microinsurance can help customers build climate resilience. Digital cash transfers from government are crucial in rebuilding lives after natural disasters. How about mitigation? Inclusive green finance supports low-income households and MSMEs in lowering their carbon footprints by accessing energy-efficient technologies and renewable energy, as well as supporting agricultural innovations. The much-needed structural change to an environmentally sustainable and resilient economy can increase inequalities. Therefore, Inclusive green finance is key to empowering low-income groups to join and contribute to an inclusive and just transition. AFI members are developing policies and strategies in response to climate change challenges. These include complementing various financial services, subsidies, and credit guarantee schemes that enhance adaptation and resilience building activities, climate risk insurance, and incentives for MSMEs to go green. Implementing effective inclusive green finance policies is creating opportunities to build back better as economies recover from COVID-19 related impacts. While climate change and environmental degradation are among the greatest challenges facing our generation, inclusive green finance encourages collaboration between governments and financial stakeholders to deliver transformative economic improvements to those who need it most.